We have a mystery on our hands, for what we do not see seems everywhere and every when. It began behind our backs and before our births, and in all likelihood shall go on well beyond our deaths. Our fathers, our mothers, our institutions, our governments, all laud and love it, honor and celebrate it. Indeed, we believe that we are born for it and that it shall bestow upon us all our hearts and minds most long for. As our religion, it seems utterly beyond question, an unconditional good, a value unto the world, perhaps even the greatest blessing of modern civilization. And what is this mystery as common as air and water and yet hidden in plain sight? It is work, and work is becoming total. It is West Germany, the year 1947. The country, now divided in two, has been decimated by war, with nearly 80% of buildings in major cities having been destroyed by Allied forces. The West German people, therefore, are very, very busy. They have not only a country, but also lives to rebuild. In this context, a lesser-known German philosopher named Joseph Pieper is sending his fellow citizens a message. He is urging them not to get their heads back down and to get back to work, but rather to stand back and to reflect upon themselves and upon the situation they find themselves in. His book, Leisure the Basis of Culture, is published one year later in 1948 and is then summarily forgotten. And what dangerous message did this strange book contain? Nothing less than a prophecy of a future in which total work would transform all human beings into workers and nothing else, while at the same time transforming all of human life into work. And work shall become total, I want to argue, when all the following conditions are met. Firstly, when work is the center around which all of human life turns. Secondly, when everything else in human life is not only put in the service of, but is also made to be subservient to work. Thirdly, when leisure, play, and festivity slowly, perhaps imperceptibly, are turned into work. Fourthly, when we come to believe that we were born to work, and finally, when all other ways of living, those that existed well before work took over the world, fall away from cultural memory. The truth is that we are on the verge of all this becoming true. Total work is no joke. Each day I speak with individuals from Silicon Valley to Wall Street, from Scandinavia to South America, those working at Google and Facebook, as well as those involved in startups, who say that they are obsessed with work. And this obsession is causing them unnecessary suffering. Consider but three examples. The first, a creative class worker, a man in his late 30s, is restless, busy, and very, very tired. He is so creatively on for two months at a time that he tends to fall ill to the point of being bedridden one week thereafter. And this pattern, two months on, followed by one week of great illness, has been going on now for the past four years. You might say that he's a workaholic, or you might say that he's close to burnout, but let's be careful with the labels. Labeling may be a way in which we try to distance ourselves from the extent to which you and I resemble him. A second example, a Cornell-educated poet and Columbia Law School-educated lawyer, due to the overwhelming demands placed upon him by his legal career, 80 to 100-hour work weeks, countless all-nighters over the years, was prescribed a cocktail of medications to treat his depression. Tragically, one of those medications ended up causing pancreatitis. One night, he was rushed to the ER, fell into a coma, and subsequently, thankfully, was revived. 
since that time in 2014, he's undergone a number of major surgeries, all in the hope of repairing the extensive damage done to his abdominal region as well as to the surrounding nerves, all with very limited success. Now, each day he has no more than two, maybe three hours of energy and is often doubled over in pain. It is no exaggeration to say that total work nearly killed him. And now a third and final example. A five-year-old boy named Nathaniel graduated from kindergarten in June 2017. On his last day of kindergarten, his teacher asked him, as well as his fellow classmates, to write about their favorite thing about kindergarten. And here is what he wrote. My favorite thing about kindergarten is work because I was born to work. Notice what he did not say. He did not say his favorite thing was playing or recess or friendships or learning or art. No, he said work. From birth to death, our lives are framed by work. This, I say, is cultural madness. But then how did we get here? How did work take over the world. The story I'm about to tell consists of three chapters. In the first chapter, I'll be discussing the ancient Greek slave society. In the second, the medieval tripartite society. And in the third, our Protestant heritage. Chapter one. The ancient Greeks came up with two insights relevant to our inquiry. The first was that labor, insofar as it tied one to the internable material needs of the body, was itself a kind of enslavement. And the second was that freedom, contemplative as well as political, was one of the highest goods. And so they saw fit to design a slave society, one in which the many slaves would work so that the few aristocrats would be freed up to devote themselves to lives of contemplation, and political engagement. Chapter 2. What must be borne in mind is that the medieval tripartite society was hierarchical through and through. On the very top were clerics or those who prayed, as well as aristocrats or those who fought, while on the very bottom were peasants or those who worked the fields. Theirs must have been lives of trouble and toil. For the Greeks, then, work was lowly, servile, ignoble, utterly contemptible. And for those living in the middle period, work was penance for original sin. And now chapter 3. But then something astonishing happens as we enter the modern period. Luther, and especially Calvin, end up turning the value of work on its head. Truly, after the Protestant Reformation, our ideas about work would never be the same. Henceforth, work would be a privilege, a calling, not a curse. Henceforth, work would be the duty of every able-bodied and every able-minded person, not a burden borne on the backs of a particular class of people. Henceforth, work would be inherently valuable, not merely a means to an end outside of it. And henceforth, the work ethic whose greatest virtue is hard work and whose greatest vice is laziness would come to control our lives and in so doing would lead us to believe that we're living for the sake of work. In short, this long journey from work being the worst sort of thing to its being the very best sort of thing helps to explain how Nathaniel the five-year-old boy I mentioned earlier, could come to believe that his natural identity was that of a worker. That is to say, his destiny, his very reason for being, was, is, and shall be to work. The basic idea, then, is that work is to be exalted and that we are to find meaning in our lives through secular callings now known as careers. It sounds pretty good, so where's the rub? Since the anthropologist David Graeber beat me to the punch when, a couple of years ago, he argued quite convincingly, the most actual work today amounts to bullshit jobs, 
I would like instead to shine a light on the lived experience of the total worker. That is to say, what it's actually like to live this way. Well, what is a typical day in the life of a total worker like? The total worker, here after abbreviated TW, wakes up early because TW has a lot to get done. Immediately, TW reaches for the phone in order to put out any fires. Next, TW sits on to meditate for exactly 10 minutes. Next, TW eats a light breakfast and then hits the gym. Afterward, TW bikes to work while listening to a podcast, and at work, TW spends the entire day trying to solve an internable set of problems, trying to complete an internable set of tasks, and above all, trying to optimize productivity. Now and again, TW does take a break on the grounds that doing so could enhance productivity even more. After a 12 to 15 hour workday, TW finally heads home, all the while receiving Slack notifications long into the night. Exhausted, TW finally goes to bed while believing still that sleep is in the service of more work. Now, what is TW's mental life like throughout the day? Overwhelmed, stressed, tensed, agitated, exhausted, overburdened, lonesome. In all this, I ask for what? TW's life is a burden waiting to burn out in despair. So what, you might say, and I would reply, we suffer our burdensome ideas about work in myriad ways. I'll mention only three. One, we let work seduce us into believing that we, by which I mean our egos, are very, very important, indeed quite precious, with the result that owing to our exceptional busyness, we continue to turn away from others, most especially from those we care about. Two, our souls, so to speak, grow narrow and shallow over time in lieu of becoming vast and broad and deep. We become, in the words of Nicholas Carr, pancake people. And three, each day we die a thousand unreported deaths, physical as well as spiritual, as we fail to learn how to truly live. Given all this unnecessary human suffering, should we not ask ourselves, does life have to be this way? We are faced, therefore, with a stark choice. Either we can waste our lives with total work, or we can wake up to the kinds of lives that truly matter. And if we wanted to wake up to the kinds of lives that truly matter, how would we go about doing so? To begin with, we could critique the supreme value of work, questioning, for example, whether work shall be a calling for all of us. What if, I wonder, work needn't be at the center of a life well lived? Second, we could disidentify from the work that we're doing, saying to ourselves, whoever I fundamentally, truly, ultimately am, I'm not what I do for a living. Indeed, let that be our personal mantra. I am not my work. These two critiques create space in us to be filled up with a new commitment, a commitment to the vita contemplativa, the contemplative life. Living this way means being entirely engrossed in love, for it is love that brings us joy, in art, for it is art that is conducive to experiences of beauty, to philosophy, for it is philosophy that rises out of wonderment and takes flight from there, and to religion or spirituality, for it is religion or spirituality that takes us beyond the bounds of the ego 
and in so doing puts us in touch with a greater abiding reality. Well over 2,000 years ago, a young, overprotected, wealthy man living in a great palace went outside one day. And there he saw illness, old age, and death. Shocked by what he saw and by the implication that human life just was suffering, he left behind the palace, went out into the forest, and there meditated with some ascetics. After a while, he went off on his own. One night, with resolve and determination, he decided to sit all night beneath a Bodhi tree. And something amazing happened. We know this man as the Buddha, the awakened one, the one who was woken up to reality. And so I leave you with a question, one that I hope will speak directly to your hearts. When will you, when will we, wake up from this too long night in the throes of total work? Thank you very much. So as you were speaking, I found myself very much relating to this idea of total work, particularly as a student. Um, how do you think that total work has affected student life? When you meet someone for the first time and you don't know that person beforehand, invariably that person will ask you two questions. First, what is your name? And second, so what do you do? It seems like a fairly harmless question, but I would submit it actually is instantiated an entire worldview in which a human being is identified with work. If total work is the transformation of human beings into workers, then regardless of how lovely school is and how important it is, how many benefits it accrue, it is the chief process by which we are transformed into knowledge workers. So you might say this is an argument on behalf of resistance. Therefore, if someone comes to you and says, what do you do? My hope is that you'll begin to listen to that stirring within yourself, the doubt, the hesitation, the dread, the angst, the uncertainty. And if you follow that uncertainty, the sense of which you are not the label being given to you, then who knows where you'll end up. Thank you very much. Thank you.